Luke Brown, I love that song even then. I think, I think Ruth sang that song. Yeah, you, you wrote it, but she sang it. I don't know how many times she said even then. That, yeah. I don't know about you, but I've been doing a pretty good job detoxing from politics and news this week. I kind of made a commitment when I came here that I was going to do what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this book of Ruth that's between all of these political, like, big story books with judges and Samuel and Kings and broke it a few times um, to play Wordle. Uh, love Wordle. 95%, 12 in a row. Anybody else play Wordle? Yeah. Don't you hate it when you don't get it? That happens to me every once in a while. Maybe, maybe you always get it. I, I, didn't, I didn't yet. I hope you captured a little bit of last night when we talked about that God is in the work of the ordinariness of your life in ways that you can't even see. Uh, we talked about that in Ruth chapter 2. We're going to go to Ruth chapter 3 today. Um, interestingly, Ruth chapter 2 lasts about one day, morning till night. Luke, I'm sorry, Ruth. Ruth chapter 2. And Ruth chapter 3 lasts one day, morning till night. Ruth chapter 1 and Ruth chapter 4, the ones on either end, those last, those cover years, okay? So it's interesting, years, day, day, years, one, two, three, four, one way to remember it. We're in chapter three. This is a super strange chapter. As of this week, I'm like being very careful how I use the word strange. Um, <laughs> now that I know Dr. Danny Strange, and he's, he's such a thoughtful speaker too. I enjoyed every time I've heard him, which is twice so far. Um, have a chance to see his beautiful family and this is a beautiful place. I love Mount Hermon, love today. Some of you probably went on a train ride, had a great time there in Santa Cruz Beach. It's hard to believe we're so close to the ocean when we're up here in the, uh, in the mountains. And it's hard to believe a, a week ago it was over 100 degrees, and I'm certainly glad it's not like that um, today. Um, food here is great. Um, I had Mary Ann's ice cream for dinner the other night, uh, which I decided I could do, and I did. Speaking of food, I, I actually left out a verse in chapter 2. I want to jump to that um, quickly, if you don't mind. It was one of those leftovers from the last chapter, no pun. Yes, it was a pun. Um, and I thought, um, I thought about this after we left the building last night. So just um, go with me to Ruth chapter 2 just for a minute. Ruth chapter 2, 14 reads this. Talking about food, right? At mealtime, Boaz said to Ruth, come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Now, this isn't a typical exchange between a boss and an employee. This is a conversation about kindness. This is a conversation about hospitality that's happening between this man and this woman that in most people's minds at that time didn't deserve anything. She was lucky to be able to glean in the fields, but more than that, he invited her to the table. It was supper time. He said, come and sit down. He invited her to share the meal. He said, join the others. He didn't even make her eat all alone. And he offered her some food, some roasted grain, and she could eat all she wanted. And at the end of the time eating, there was leftover. She brought it back to Naomi in a doggy bag. Didn't say doggy bag. That's a marginal reading, but you know what I mean. So Boaz is communicating that one way that he demonstrates grace and kindness is through a meal. I love meals. I love to eat, um, as I just told you. I had my own ideas when, uh, when Danny Strange was saying, like, what's your favorite snack that you can't stop eating? Mine would be, like, chocolate-covered raisins. Um, but food is something. Food is something we have, we have in common with, with 7 billion people in this world, Right? Some eat too much. Some don't have enough to eat. Uh, but we all depend on food. And food is often the centerpiece of celebrations, the centerpiece of gatherings. My mother's kitchen was this, like, wonderful place of creative homemade cuisine. It was Swedish meatballs and, and baked macaroni and, and raspberry pie. And, and, and her kitchen was her canvas. My mother, who's 95 years old now, when she's gone, she's going to be remembered for love that, that showed up in her cinnamon rolls. I mean, that's just the way, and, and you are that way too, so many of you, and many of you have those in your life that have, have loved you through meals. Our son, who's 23 years old, his name's Sam, he's a, he's, a, he's a foodie, 
He bakes artisan bread, ratatouille. He, he roasts coffee beans. Sometimes our kitchen looks like a meth lab. Um, <laughs> and, and meals are often the starting point of, of coming through pain and, and getting to deep joy and, and, and healing. And, and we see that in Ruth at supper time. Boaz says to Ruth, Ruth, come and sit at my table. And, and this, is, this is radical. This is actually scandalous. For a man of that prominence, which you found out yesterday, he had prominence. He had standing for him to invite this alien woman, this Moabite-ess, to eat at his table and treated her in such a kind way. And remember what Ruth just said in verses 10 and 13 in chapter 2. Why have I found such favor? We talked about favor yesterday. In your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not even have the standing of one of your servant girls. In other words, she's saying, because all your servant girls that you have, like, I don't have their standing, and they're like, their standing's pretty low, so I'm even lower than that. So it's one thing that he let her pick up the the leftover barley out there in the fields. It's another thing. They invited her to table supper that night. I actually believe, if you read in scripture, it happens over and over, grace often happens around the table. And we say grace at the table, right? Because that's where grace happens. And hospitality is, is is this gospel mandate that we have. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, right? The writer of Hebrews says, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels, unaware or without knowing it. I was uh, going for a run in downtown Fullerton um, some time ago, and I remember I was running. It was early in the morning. I see two guys walking up the street, one taller, one shorter. The taller guy had a flannel shirt, long hair. There, there are some um, people in our city that don't have places to live, and they're walking the streets early in the morning, and I thought, okay, I'm going to run by these people who are kind of down and out, and as I uh, ran by one, I kind of kept my head down because, I don't know, I didn't want to be asked for anything, whatever it was, so I confessed. Um, and the guy I was running by said, hey, Barry. And, and I looked up, and it was, um, it was Greg Tanelsoff, one of our philosophy professors at Biola, like a super smart guy. And I said, hey, Greg, what are you doing here in Fullerton? He said, um, I'm here with my friend Dave. And they had two big bags of McDonald's. And, and I said, oh, wow, all right. Enjoy your day, and I just kind of kept on running. But it kind of bothered me. He didn't live in Fulton. So the next day I saw him at Biola, and I said, I said, Greg, like, what were you really doing? It didn't seem like you wanted to tell me. I finally pulled it out of him. He said, well, my friend Dave and I, um, every once in a while, we go to McDonald's in Fullerton, and we load up on breakfast McMuffins, and we go to find those who are homeless, and we have breakfast with them. He didn't say we, we give them food. He said we breakfast together. Here's like one of the smartest guys on our campus who's an award-winning author, and early in the morning when no one's looking anonymously, this is how he's living his life. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. We're hospitable, as Boaz was hospitable to Ruth, the undeserved one, because this is what God calls him to do. And, and I, I will say we're hospitable because this is, grace is what we've received. God, through Christ, was hospitable to us. The cross is the most shocking symbol of hospitality. Sometimes we think of this rugged, bloody image, but it really is where grace's greatest moment was. And interestingly... That cross moment was flanked by two meals, wasn't it? We have the Last Supper when Jesus said, remember what I'm going to do on your behalf out of my love for you. And then after, when Jesus had risen from the dead, there he is on the side of the sea cooking breakfast for the disciples. And among the last words finally, finally recorded of Jesus, he said to his disciples, come and have breakfast. 
And, that, and the Bible, God's word, ends with that same invitation of Jesus in Revelation 3.20 where he says, here I am as I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And sometimes we stop there, but we forget the rest of the verse. I will come in and eat with that person and they with me, Jesus, suppers with us. And sometimes we need to see supper as a verb and not just as a noun. Jesus seems to be saying to us, if you invite me to supper with you for a meal, I will invite you to supper with me for eternity. This is grace. And there's so much about Boaz, who is called the Redeemer, right? So we have to think about something might be happening in advance of the gospel stories there in the book of Ruth when Boaz invites Ruth to the table as her kinsman Redeemer, opens up the table for her as undeserved as she is in anticipation of Christ the Redeemer who opens up his table for us. And I wonder if that supper Redeemer Boaz offers for Ruth maybe in some way points us to Christ's death for our life in the Last Supper. This is just kind of a little bit of leftovers from yesterday that I thought about after I left last night and just thought maybe you need to hear that, some of you today, that Jesus invites you to his table of grace to live fully and freely the life that he has to offer you. So don't be so proud. Say, Lord, I'm opening myself up to come to your table and have what you have for me, which is his grace. Okay, so thanks for letting me wrap up chapter two with something I wanted to say. That was the appetizer. Now we get to the main course. The main course is chapter three. I'm going to try to get through this today. Um, before... Midnight, I will be done. I promise you that. So we're going to go right to chapter 3. So let's go there. Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor is how it begins in this version here. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now, Boaz, whose woman you have worked as, is a relative of ours. Um... And tonight, uh, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. This is a strange chapter, so just bear with me. It's some weird stuff here. Wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. And don't let him know that you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went, down, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I'm your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if not, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. Anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed a bundle on her. Then he went back to town. And when Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi said, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. This is a, a quite an odd chapter, I will say. Um, remember in um, 
yesterday, uh, Ruth was the, the initiator, right? She was the one who went out to the fields to glean, to bring food back to Naomi. And now we have a very different story in chapter 3. Naomi is the initiator, right? Uh, she's, she seems to be coming to life from the emptiness at the end of chapter 1. Tragedies, losing her sons, losing her husband. And it seems like that, that, that darkness in Naomi is beginning to, to transform into light, at least glimmers of light. This bitter Naomi is now recognizing that God's kindness, his loving kindness, his chesed as it, it word in that, it's hard to even define in the Old Testament. And she's seeing that through others. And as you read scripture, I, I'm convinced like Ruth and Boaz are like, are like two of the like most remarkable like people that you want to model your life after. In, in all of the Bible, and like a lot of people named Ruth, right? In the world today, like, but I don't know why they don't name the kid Boaz. Because like he's also like this really great person. Any day now, I'm gonna become a grandfather. I know. I'm so excited. Our uh, son and daughter-in-law, they live in Pasadena, are having for the first child. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Neither do they. They know the names of if it's a boy or a girl, and we don't. So that's kind of the way it is right now. But the, this child is, is due imminently, and I actually hope if it's a boy, they name him Boaz. Um, I haven't told them that yet. I've just thought of that today. They can call him Bo um, if they don't like Boaz, but... Um, I don't know why we don't have more Boazes in this world. Because Boaz is like demonstrate like this incredible grace and mercy that is God breathed within him. And he is giving it to those who are most unlikely. And, and, and I believe that this whole book is showing us these, these morsels of grace and mercy in these dark seasons. And how they open up to a brighter future when it's been so dark for maybe many of you. And this happens, I believe, through the book of Ruth to, to show that in, in all of our ordinary circumstances, God is at work in some kind of sovereign way that we can't see. We talked about that yesterday, right? All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Not some things, but all things. So everything's included in that all, and if you read the book of Ruth, you believe this to be true because you see slowly in all of the darkness, things are coming together. And now Naomi is beginning to think, hey, these pieces are coming together. Maybe Boaz can be a husband to Ruth. And so she begins thinking about that possibility of someone to marry her widowed daughter-in-law. And she probably never thought that day was going to come when Orpah and Ruth, the two wives of her now dead sons um, back in Moab, she said, go back to your homes, go back to your gods, go back to your families, go back to your stuff. And Orpah means back of head left, so you saw the back of her head, she left. But, but Ruth clung to her and said, no, I'm going to go with you. And remember that great, that, that, that King James Version language when she said to, to Naomi, whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God will be my God. And where thou diest, I will die, and there I will be buried. Ruth clung to Naomi and headed into Bethlehem. With all of those uncertainties in her life, we talked about uncertainties two days ago. And she, she practiced Trusting God in the mundaneness of her life. And may it not be lost on us that, that all of this new life in her is happening in a small town in Judah called Bethlehem. And can't you see how this, this, this little book is packed with meaning far beyond the story of this, this grieving and struggling family. There is light that is dawning chapter by chapter, pointing us towards Bethlehem, which we're going to really see powerfully tomorrow. So Naomi, in this weird way, she begins planning, and actually she begins scheming. She wants to win Boaz over for Ruth. 
She wants to see them married. She wants to see them secure a, a good future to, to preserve the family that she had once lost back in, in, in Moab. It, it, uh, you know, basically, her family all but evaporated there, and she thought she was done. And now there's this glimmer of hope now with Boaz on the scene. And so here's Naomi's odd plan for Ruth. She said, bathe yourself and, you know, put some perfume on, dress in your finest of clothes, and go down at night. This sounds so scandalous, right? Like, go down at night to the threshing floor where Boaz is asleep after he's had something to eat and something to drink, feeling good about himself. Watch where he lies down, and then go and uncover his feet with whatever cloak is over it by lifting up that cloak, and then lie down beside him and do what he tells you to do. You know, folks, don't try this at home. Well, try it at home, but don't try it at work. Let me just say that, okay? Like, yeah, yeah. like Ruth had, must have been like, like, wondering, like, what are you talking about? But Ruth trusted Naomi. Maybe it was a cultural thing. And, 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 and so why did Naomi ask Ruth to do all of these strange things? And the simple answer from my perspective is, I don't know. There are probably some scholars that do know. I, I haven't figured that out yet, why all that happened. But all that happened. Um, but I don't really believe that Ruth would have said yes to that scheme had she not trusted Boaz too. Told to go down and lie down next to him alone at night in the threshing floor. You remember Naomi um, and Ruth were just devastated people. And Ro Ray Naomi had, had come back uh, from Moab empty and R Ruth clung to her so that she'd be able to be like full again. And, and, and I, I was just, as I was reading this passage again, I just keep seeing the words empty and full, empty and full throughout this book. The first chapter ended with Naomi's words. I'm going to get back to the threshing floor in a minute, so hang on for a second. This is a little, little tangent here. But the first chapter ended with the words, remember Naomi said, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And then later in this chapter, we see Boaz gives Ruth six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Empty and full, the, the story begins with emptiness, this, this woman who lost her sons and her husband. But by the end of the first chapter, the emptiness is getting fuller as we see these barley sprouts coming to life and signs of hope. And then as we get into the next chapter, these barley sprouts turn into a harvest and she gleans in the field. And Ruth comes back with about 10 liters of barley for Naomi. And then we get to the end of this chapter, chapter 3, and she comes back with even more as she fills up her whole scarf with all of this barley, drags it back to Naomi. Again, this book is pointing towards the, the, the fullness of Christ, which we're going to powerfully see tomorrow. Full and empty. The Bible says Christ emptied himself and took on our sin and became nothing so that we would have the fullness of life. Here's my little tangent. If you're feeling empty, like Naomi, just know that God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit and with his redeeming love. And I pray for you the Ephesians 3 prayer Paul prayed that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God's fullness replaces your emptiness. This is one of the themes in the book of Ruth. Okay, meanwhile, back on the threshing floor, I got away from that. So Ruth lays down by Boaz, okay? Imagine this, it's, it's, it's nighttime, and it's, it's, it's a way of her saying that I am willing to marry you. And it may have been, this is, I'm not so sure about this, and maybe you can help me with it later on, but it may have been that, that Ruth's commitment to Naomi that she made back in Moab, remember, Sukasa, Mikasa, your journey, my journey, your people, my people, your God, my God. This, this might have been her way of, of, of saying that I want to go onto the threshing floor to indicate that I am willing to marry Boaz 
maybe even as a type of, of surrogate to her mother-in-law who has been emptied of her own family. And the reason why I'm wondering about that, because we're going to get to tomorrow, you'll see that when Ruth does have a child, the women of the city, we're going to talk about this tomorrow, when Ruth has a child, they say this, they say, Naomi has a son, not Ruth. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And then we get to verse 10, and Boaz says, there on the flushing, uh, the, the, the uh, threshing floor, he says, the Lord bless you, my daughter. Your kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor, and now don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. So here's Boaz acknowledging the profound kindness that he noticed that Ruth shows toward Naomi. Yesterday we talked about the, 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 the powerful Christian virtue of favor. And I just want to pause here to talk about the powerful Christian virtue of, of kindness. I believe kindness is demonstrated more in the book of Ruth than any other book in the Bible. Boaz and Ruth, they lived, they, they were both noble and kind. They both lived profoundly selfless and kind lives. And, and I, I've been thinking like a lot, what does it mean to be kind? You know, it's easy to be kind when you go into Starbucks and, and the, the barista gets your, your latte right, right? It's easy to be kind to say thank you. It's easy to be kind when, when there's when there's harmony in your family, when you're getting along with your friends, when you're in your own echo chamber with people that think like you and believe like you and vote like you and look like you. But it's a lot harder to be kind with those who we disagree with and deeply disagree agree with. And I don't use the word kindness as a synonym to niceness. It's way different than niceness. Niceness is such a bland word. We need to stop telling our kids to be nice and start telling them to be kind and tell them the difference between the two. Kindness is all over the Bible. Kindness, kind-heartedness, loving kindness, all over the Old Testament, New Testament, certainly throughout the book of Ruth. You're not going to find the word nice in the Bible or niceness anywhere because kindness is this powerful virtue. It's, it's rooted in Scripture. It's forged, forged on, on deep Christian theology has been lived out by the people of God for centuries. And unfortunately, I believe kindness more and more is a forgotten virtue. And kindness isn't, isn't the thing we do. It's, it's, the, it's the way we live. We don't just do kindness in this Nike-esque kind of way. We, we live kindness. We love kindness. That passage in Micah 6, 8, for what shall I come before the Lord? And he has this three-part answer, to do justice and to love kindness. We say love mercy. It actually means to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And you think of, like, what, of all those three, to do justly and to love kindness and to walk humbly, it seems like loving kindness is the easiest thing to do. And it is. Until you think about what does it mean to be, to be kind to those that I've judged or condemned or ridiculed or have seen as my enemy, or maybe those who have gotten on my very last nerve. Being kind to those we like is pretty easy, and it costs us very little. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And he uses two verbs there, right? He used the word love and pray. And I think sometimes we're good at doing one or the other. You know, what does it mean to love your neighbor? Well, we know what that means. And when Jesus says you either love your neighbor or love your enemy, by enemy he's saying that those who are not your neighbor, not those, those you're combating with, but maybe those who are outside of your neighborhood, outside of your community. How do you love them and pray for them? And sadly, sometimes we do one or the other. We love without prayer or we pray without love. And when we love our enemies without praying for them, we might have a great relationship, but we don't long to see the gospel help transform their lives. Or we, we pray without loving, and that means we pray from a distance. And loving your enemy like demands proximity. 
you can't love from a distance. I'm just thinking more and more that when Jesus says you love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, you you don't get to pick which verb. In that sense, um, kindness is is way more of 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 a radical act than a random act. You know, we like, we like random acts of kindness. I'm all for them. You know, you, 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 you randomly pay for some stranger in a restaurant. You, you buy their dessert for them. You don't tell them who it was, and they get the bill, and it says paid in full. Or you, you take out your elderly neighbor's trash, or you, you know, tell your friend she has spinach in her teeth. Whatever that, you know, whatever that kind thing is that you do, those are the random acts of kindness. I like that. You know, I'm at Biola University. I try to be kind to the people I, I, I'm working with. Students especially, they're walking down the sidewalk, you know, fist pump, high five, how you doing, talking to them, ha- have, a, have a great day. Someone showed me a Facebook posting after one of those encounters. Uh, it said this, today a DBC president of Biola put his hand on my shoulder, looked me in the eyes and asked me, how am I doing? He smelled like flowers though. This dog's aroma made me feel like, dang, I'm a be okay. I'm struggling, but I can do it just saying. <laughs> Actually, what, what is he just saying? You know, <laughs> smells like flowers, this dog's aroma, you know, I don't know which one it was. Um, random acts of kindness, we do those. Those are great to do, but... but Kindness is not a random act. Kindness is this radical life. It's this countercultural way of living biblically that Boaz show, showed towards Ruth. He had nothing to gain by his kindness. It's what Ruth, uh, Naomi, uh, Ruth showed towards Naomi. She had nothing to gain by clinging to her and not going back. And it's countercultural because we are called to be kind, whether we are accepted or not. I had a front row of kindness when I was a, when I was a kid growing up. My, my father, who's a small frame Canadian preacher, um, June 27th of this year, he would have turned 100, died when he was 75 years old. But, but when, when I was a kid, like, in like profoundly awkward ways, he would just like, to me, he would like, he couldn't help but just like love people because of the Jesus in him. And um, he would like hug the Islamic gas station attendant or he would, getting his shoes fixed at the cobbler, he'd tell the old Armenian cobbler who had these gnarly knuckles and shoe polish over his fingers, he'd say, can I pray for you? And silently he'd hold his hands across that counter and and, and pray. And I'd stand at the door of the cobbler's shop praying too that no one would come in, right? And see them praying with each other. And one time my father had the audacity to go up to Reuben. Reuben was a Jewish furniture merchant in Worcester, Massachusetts where my father bought office furniture and stuff. And and, and up there shopping one day and I saw it coming. I go, oh no, here he goes. And he walked up to Reuben, and he, and he took Reuben's face in his hands, and he said, Reuben, I love you. And I go, oh, I can't believe you did that. And I want to crawl under a desk or run out of the store. And, and I saw my father do that over and over again, and it was awkward and very peculiar for me. I'd slink down in the back seat of the car, and we'd hug the Islamic gas station attendant, and I was hoping he wouldn't do it when I was in his presence. And there were times that I saw him get the rude comment or the four-letter word or the cold shoulder, and, and he was unimpeded by that. He couldn't help it. He just lived his life that way. Years later, I spent a year in Bangladesh, and I was there on a research assignment on a government grant, and and my father came through just to visit. He was in India on his way to Singapore doing some missionary stuff, and um, it was during the first Gulf War, and, and, and we were curfewed, but we could go walk around the neighborhood, and one morning, my father and I went for a walk, and as we were walking, um, he said, there's this verse I can't get out of my mind. We've been on a lot of walks and had lots of conversations over the years. I said, what is it? He said, it's in Matthew chapter 10. And immediately I thought, oh, yeah, you know, pick up your cross and follow me. And I said, well, is that the verse? And he said, actually, it's not the verse. It's Matthew 10, verse 40, where Jesus says to his disciples, whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. He said, Barry, I don't fully understand what Jesus meant, but this I do know, that whoever God places in my path, I'm going to make myself receivable. For how will they receive the love of Christ? How will they receive the grace of God unless they receive me first? And it was as if my 
life flash before my eyes. Hugging the Islamic gas station attendant. Praying over the counter with the Armenian cobbler. Holding Reuben's face in his hands and saying, Reuben, I love you. My father wasn't being weird. Like he was being receivable. And Jesus never said you're going to be received. He said you make yourself receivable. Because sometimes your acts of kindness will, will fall on receptive ears and sometimes they won't. But that should not stop you from living into that mandate because we're kind not in order to be thanked. We're kind in order to be obedient. And this is the radical nature of, of kindness. And sometimes our kindness is going to be accepted. Sometimes our kindness is going to be rejected. But our kindness is never going to be forgotten because I believe it plants a seed in someone's life that will germinate one day, maybe long after we're on the scene. You know, that student's post on Facebook, this dog's aroma, uh, you know, he actually, theologically, he kind of had it right. Because Paul said, you are the aroma of Christ. To some, you're the smell of life. To others, you're, you're the smell of death. You just got to keep on smelling like Jesus. Some will receive your Jesus fragrance. Others will reject your Jesus fragrance, but you have to keep on emitting, emitting that, that Jesus fragrance from you. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you go to Peabody, Massachusetts today and uh, go to the uh, Puritan Lawn Memorial Park, you'll see a gravestone there. And it has um, Reverend Hugh McLeod Corey. 1922, 1998, Matthew 10:40. Whoever receives you receives me, Jesus said. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. I am so bad at living out that lifestyle of kindness. I'm trying to take these baby steps forward. And, but, but kindness is this, this, this profoundly biblical way of encouraging people, especially those people that don't see your kindness coming outside of your circles of influence, how is God prompting you to live the profoundly kind life and do it in a way where you expect nothing in return? For kindness is not about being thanked. Kindness is about being obedient. And we see these gestures of kindness in the book of Ruth and Sometimes kindness smells like flowers, and sometimes kindness looks like barley sprouts. And we're seeing it here in third chapter, and, and up until this point in the book, and I'm almost done, there are, there are no sexual relations that have happened in, in this book, but there are a lot of friendships, these friendships that are deep spiritual friendships, friendships that are, that are rooted in profound kindness and respect and humility and favor, such, such transcendent virtues that they're the way God intended things to be. And, and kindness is, is making yourself receivable. And we see that happened when, when Ruth made herself receivable to Naomi and said, I'm going to go with you, even means giving up everything. When Boaz made himself receivable to Ruth, you said, you come and you put your legs under my table and you eat here. I'm going to give you a, a, a meal. You're not just like picking up the scraps on the field. Why don't you sit down with my people and just eat like you're part of the family? And I want you to notice something, too, because I think this is something that we need to grapple with when it comes to being receivable. In the book of Ruth, being receivable cut across social, economic, national, cultural, ethnic, gender barriers. Everything was like outside of the normal social order of how things should be. And kindness broke that down. Being receivable extended beyond the normal places where you make yourself receivable. Luke Brown and guys, get up here. Start playing something spiritual. I'm, got, I'm about done now. Okay. Let me, um, let me just say this. This is what I tell students at, 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 at Biola. Um, I'm almost done. I feel like the antidote to, for so much that is wrong in the world today is, is, um, is we're not living with what I call a firm center and soft edges. 
the firm center having like a deep sense of what is right and what is true and what comes from God's word and we live into that, we believe in it passionately. But by soft edges, I mean we, we extend ourselves, leading with hospitality, leading with kindness, leading with opening up our table, leading with listening to others, listening while wanting to learn, not listening while waiting to respond. And there's a difference. Too many today are, are, are leading lives with firm center and hard edges. And everything's a battle. And I can honestly say we're not winning these culture wars very well. Others are kind of doing the opposite. Soft edges, but this spongy center, live and let live. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. Everything's okay as long as it's right for you. That's exactly what happened in the end of the book of Judges. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. But I do believe that the antidote to so much of what's wrong in our world today is to live that life of a firm center and soft edges. It's kind of like my bumper sticker language. It's not a bumper sticker. It's, it's, it's the gospel. Right? Jesus came full of truth, firm center, full of grace, soft edges. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, firm center. You love your neighbors yourself, soft edges. Be wise as serpents, firm center. Be gentle as doves, soft edges. Always be prepared to defend the hope you have, firm center, but do so with gentleness and respect. This is the life that God has called us to. This is what Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, the three main actors in the book of Ruth, are understanding more and more. Jesus said, love your enemies, soft edges, and pray for those who persecute you, firm center. It's what we do. The gospel calls us to be those kinds of people. And I exhort you, Mount Hermon campers, this week that as you leave here at the end of the week and you descend the hill and go to the places that God has called you to the ordinariness of your life, know that God is providentially working in every situation that you live into. And in response, you live lives of gratitude and humility, compassion, seeking favor, firm center, soft edges. My dear friend Brian Loretz, who is gonna be a speaker here a few weeks from now, said this, we've tried legalism, and that has proven inept and unattractive. Some are trying a warped form of love that renders us thoughtless. The only thing, the only thing that works is a life that embodies grace and truth lived out in relationship with others. I believe more and more that we as God's people need to be known for our radical kindness read the second chapter of Romans, it begins with a lot of work of words about how wrong it is to be judgmental. And then when you get to verse 4, it says, but God's kindness leads to repentance. It's not my mouthing off, it's not my judgment, it's not my disembodied tweet that I send, my social media post that's nasty and harsh that leads to repentance. It's God's kindness through me that leads to repentance. Again, your kindness may be accepted, it may be rejected, but it'll never be forgotten because your kindness plants a God seed in somebody that might linger there for a while and then germinate one day, long after you're on the scene, in a way where the gospel has an influence on that person. The great Boston preacher, A.J. Gordon, Adoniram Judson Gordon, Gordon Conwell, Gordon College, named after him, said these words, our task is not to bring all the world to Christ, but our task unquestionably is to bring Christ to all the world. That's our call, folks. Let's live into it. And let me end with the words of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, which you need to also hear as the words of Christ, your redeemer to you. And now, my child, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. As surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Father, we receive those words, and we do so in Jesus' name.